Um, I give a talk on Protractor, but it's almost more of a talk on end-to-end -end testing. Um, the Protractor itself isn't really that big a deal. It's kind of all the components and frameworks that it brings together that are kind of the more interesting thing. Uh, can I see how many people do end-to-end -end testing? Wow! Crap, I was not expecting that many people to do that. That's awesome. Uh, how many people have at least toyed with Selenium or a WebDriver? Okay, cool. So this is going to be just more or less a speed date. Uh, first, what is Protractor? It is really just a framework of frameworks. It's kind of pulling together a whole bunch of different things. It brings together the WebDriver, specifically WebDriver AS uh, library, which is uh, toolkit to talk to a Selenium server, and it utilizes existing frameworks, so Jasmine, Mocha, Cucumber, if you're already using those, you're going to be right at home because it's already using the exact same thing you are familiar with. Uh, so it really just ties everything together, and it does that by uh, basically a configuration file, does a whole bunch of background stuff for you, it replaces Karma for end to end testing if you're using Angular. Um, but if you're not using Angular, it's not a big deal. You can still use Protractor. So, why do you need end to end testing? Well, biggest reason is because you cannot otherwise test real interactions in a real browser, real deployment scenarios, real data. Obviously, if you're mining your data, that's not quite true. But sometimes things behave differently once you're actually using a browser. That's why we all love IE, right? Uh, so we use it to basically validate that your components are doing what you're expecting to do, that that pop-up calendar actually pops up. Um, and the other benefit of it is you can write a single test and point it to all these different environments, and you have that one test testing everything so that you know your local test that you've run locally, same, no extra effort, just point at a different server and you know that everything works the exact same way. So, there are a lot of people who raised their hands when I asked if you ever played with it, why didn't you stick with it? Because it sucked. I don't know how many of you, like your first introduction to Selenium was the IDE Firefox plugin where you could record stuff and man, things broke all the time. Um, so, doesn't quite suck so much anymore. Part of that's protractors, part of it's other things. Um, so now we have Selenium Grids. It doesn't take so long to run your test because you can basically send one test to one server to run IE, another test to another server Firefox, they run in parallel, you get results a lot faster. And like I said before, you already know the syntax, so you don't have to necessarily learn a whole lot of new stuff. You're just writing your Jasmine tests. And the API is pretty simple. Um, the browser drivers have gotten a lot better. There's a lot less flakiness in them. However, I will point out that in the Protractor GitHub repository, where you can put labels on issues, there's a flakiness label, and it has one ticket associated with IE. Um, so Protractor tries to make all this stuff suck less. So does this other program called the Intern IO. If you haven't checked it out, look at it. It's pretty interesting. Um, we aren't using it at my current position. I should say I'm with Object Partners currently for the Natural Gas Club. Um, because we already have a bunch of stuff already in place. But if you are starting a project from scratch, you may want to check this out. It might help some of the um, some of the quirks that are still in the existing frameworks like Protractor. Um, but if you're doing an Angular site, I'd probably stick with Protractor because that's what the Angular team uses. So this gets to why Protractor. Uh, so like I said, Protractor wraps a bunch of different frameworks including WebDriver.js which you could use directly. But if you have an Angular site, you get a lot of really cool stuff with it. Um, most of the big things are the buy models, or I should say buy finders, so you can find things by your models, by your bindings, uh, including support for a lot of repeat things. Uh, you have 
this wait for Angular, which will basically pause your test until Angular, the app, is ready to go. So you don't have to kind of manually hold for that. For, for non-Angular sites, uh, you get some additional buy stuff. So Protractor basically wraps web driver stuff and they've added a couple of additional um, buy locators for you, including CSS containing text. So if you want to find something that has a particular class but a particular inner HTML value, you can do that. I believe that also works with partials. You can write your own custom locators. So if you have handlebar stuff in there, you can actually find that. Uh, and then they put a bunch of globals in there. Uh, element by uh, single and double dollar. The single and dollar, double dollar work pretty much like jQuery, so you're probably familiar with them. We'll get a little bit more into those. Um, and then Protractor just makes a lot of the setup easy. And if you're using, if we're using Jasmine 1.3, uh, asynchronous isn't always easy to deal with, so Protractor takes care of some of that for you. Uh, so there's a couple other levels that. other globals that are defined. One is a protractor global. This basically wraps the web driver namespace. Click on that link that takes you to that web driver namespace. You can see the entire API that's in there. Um, I'm not going to go over it, but the documentation doesn't really spell that out very well for you. So it's good to know that, oh yeah, I can go to this other API documentation site and there's a whole bunch of extra functionality that you can use. Uh, and then there's a browser global which wraps your instance of the web driver. So you can do things like delete cookies or something that you might need to do that's kind of low level. Uh, the other reason I want to use Protractor, that's a comparison of what a Protractor compared to uh, WebDriver.js. Uh, you can see just the use of that element global, you don't have to do driver.find element. They automatically initialize the driver for you as that browser global, so you don't have to deal with this in every single one of your specs. Oh, and you don't have to do this manual quick on here. You couldn't put some. Uh, asynchronous commands. Um, the WebDriver JS API, everything is a promise. So, but it has this thing called control flow where basically all your lines that you're calling get put into this queue, and so it takes care of that kind of promise unwrapping for you. These two lines are exactly the same as WebDriver doing that, and Protractor uses that to its advantage because it will do the same thing with the expect. So when you call get title, that returns a promise, expect knows how to unwrap that for you. So what do you get out of the box? Uh, when you do, when you install Protractor, everything goes into your node modules. Uh, under Protractor, there's two important directories. One is bin, one is selenium. Uh, you get jasmine, 1.3. doesn't really care what your project.json says. It has its own version of jasmine that gets included. It is 1.3 at the moment. You don't have a choice on that. Yeah, you can't read that little Chinese text. That's there on purpose. <laughs> um, it will install this thing called WebDriver Manager, which I'll get into a little bit, but basically that will install and uh, update a standalone Selenium server for you and give you some browser driver support. So this standalone Selenium server, it's basically a jar file that runs by itself and acts as a Selenium server on your local host. And it comes out with the Chrome driver so you can get up and running quickly. And element explorer.js, which is basically a toolkit that you can kind of interactively uh, do things with your page, testing your locators. So where does everything run? Well, this is what's kind of cool about Protractor stuff and actually just the Selenium setup in general. Uh, your Protractor, your tests basically run somewhere, localhost, Jenkins, whatever you have. And when you run it, it will send commands to a Selenium server. A Selenium can serve be local host, it could be a Selenium grid, it could be Sauce Labs, 
and those will then point to whatever URL you basically told it to go to, which would be localhost or a dev stage QA um, website, and it'll test whatever's on that box. So this is another way to look at it. Again, Protractor just sits in the middle, communicates with one of your test frameworks, basically sends commands to the WebDriver.js, and sends everything back down. Well, that's another way to look at it. I'm a visual person. I'll let you guys dig through these slides on your own time, but kind of gives you just a couple of different ways of getting to know it. So really easy. Again, install. I like to do it global. Um, really simple spec. Looks pretty much like the test or specs you probably have already done this using Jasmine. Uh, your config file, it has a lot of really sensible defaults, so you can get away with a very minimal config. And run it's basically protractor space whatever your config file name is so that says protractor config.js down there so configuration I'm not going to go over the configuration the uh, doc file that they have is really well documented super heavy in comments I'm just going to go through some of the highlights they have this thing called sharp test file so you can actually run two different specs at the same time make your testing go really fast if you've written them properly there's not prepare, which basically happens before it starts firing away everything. There's cool stuff you can do in there for setting up reporters, you can take screenshots on fail, that kind of stuff. And then there's a thing called params where you can basically, any object you want will be injected into all your tests available. All right, so I'll add maybe a little bit of config. Uh, if you are running non Angular app, all you need to do is make sure you call ignore synchronization true. There's a couple of examples of how you can do that. Uh, and then you can share config pretty easily. So you might want to have one config for local, one config for prod. And you could basically create a base config and extend it over write some stuff and just make sure you're pointing to that other file. And this is just to give you a couple of ideas of some of the cool stuff you can do with the, in the on prepare. Um, this is going through some of like the screenshot stuff. Uh, again, I've prepared some of these slides just so you can dig through them on your own. Um, setting up the screenshots for Jasmine on fail was kind of a pain in the butt, so I figured if I can save anybody a little bit of headache. Uh, front protractor, really all it's useful for is overriding some of your stuff in your config. So if you don't want to create a bunch of different config files, create the one, uh, make the grunt task basically to overload stuff. This was kind of new to me. I didn't know you could put a whole bunch of colons in a grunt task, and that basically acts as parameters that you're passing into a function. So you could basically have your first per parameter be like what kind of test suite you want to do, second parameter be what location, prod dev, whatever, and third one be what browser you want to run. It's pretty cool. Um, Protractor has this thing called multi-capabilities where you can set up config for multiple browsers in this one variable. Front doesn't let you override that for some reason. Uh, so that's kind of a pain in the butt. And then we have this problem where our test would fail on Jenkins, but the build wouldn't fail it was because of this keep alive, it needs to be false. Uh, and then testing in general, again, this is not specific to Protractor, page objects are awesome. So a page object is basically create a object class file, whatever you want to call it, that encapsulates your page and the behavior functionality of it so that you have kind of more of a DSL going on. So this is an example of an Angular demo page. You've got this function called set inputs where you can basically send it to different values and it sets things for you. Um, how many know about autocomplete with JS docs? Not very many, okay. You put in JS docs on a method and you're using one of the IntelliJ or WebStorm IDEs when you are in a different file that uses that, it'll auto-complete those things for you as if you're using Java. It's really cool. So 
So this is what your test looks like when you're using page objects. Very, very reasonable. You know exactly what's going on. You could give that to a business person and ask them if that's right. Um, project structure, I just want to say think about it uh, and stick to it. The biggest thing is if you have a group of specs that are all kind of related to each other, put them all together because Protractor has a command option to run a suite. So you can say run suite profile and run everything in that's just a profile suite. Uh, so some nitty gritty of locators. This was something that bit me a lot when I was first trying to learn Protractor. Uh, whenever you call by dot whatever, it returns a locator object. A locator object gets passed into the element functions or element dot all. Basically, that element all gets multiple, return multiple. That returns an element finder. It doesn't actually get you anything. It's just instructions on how to get something. Then, when you say whatever my element is dot click or something, that actually will then finally go to the browser to go do something. Uh, and that will actually return a promise to you, so when it actually goes to do its thing. And you can chain them. Uh, debugging. This is where, again, testing sucks. I, don't, I haven't found a good way to debug, honestly. Um, the, I've tried using the debugger, I've tried using pause, they don't really work very well. Um, I don't have a good answer for this. This is where I've only been using Protractor for uh, a couple months now. I don't have the answers for this. It takes more research. I have a bunch of links on here. Hopefully you'll have to come up with some answers and share the knowledge. Gotcha. So this is a really, really, really big list. That slide <laughs> kept getting longer and longer. Um, I'll go over some real quick. PTOR, you'll find a whole bunch of examples on Stack Overflow that use that first line. Don't use that. That's all from really, really, really old stuff. It's no longer valid. Just use browser. Um, Chrome only has been deprecated. It was basically a quick, easy way to run your test in just Chrome. Now there's this new thing called Direct Connect so that you can basically run Firefox or Chrome. Um, WebDriver Promises is not Q library that a lot of people are used to, so just take a look at the API so you know what it actually is. Same kind goes for assertions, it's not what I was expecting. Um, protractor API, this goes back to that whole there's a web driver API and a protractor API. Look at them both because you have all that functionality that's in the web driver JS API. And they don't quite make that clear in the API docs. Um, Links on there for manual bootstrapping timeouts, timeouts, timeouts. Uh, and again, Protractor dictates your version of Jasmine. We thought we were running Jasmine 2. We were not. Uh, at least not on our Protractor tests. Uh, and the thing to remember while you're writing tests is the send keys really sends keys. If you have multiple tests running and you're not clearing out the value, you could just be adding to what was already in, a, in an input. So it's helpful to do a clear on it first. Uh, so what still sucks, it's still tough to debug. Visibility, um, some of the drivers, if an element isn't actually on the screen and you say click, the test will fail. It won't automatically scroll to that thing for you. Um, there's a lot of driver differences. Again, that intern project has this other project inside of it called Leadfoot that tries to normalize some of those differences for you. I think they should team up with the Protractor team. <laughs> um, there's no speed throttle. So in the old Firefox IDE thing, there's this little slider that you could do to how fast the test ran so you could actually watch the test. I don't have that anymore. I got rid of it. Boom. Um, and just keeping it on top changes. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> So here's a slide, more and more, other cool stuff. Okay, I'm gonna go over the other cool stuff real quick. Uh, Gulp Protractor will basically look at your Protractor's tests and tell you if you have a selector that's not really valid. Uh, FS Extra has a cool little function in called Ensure Directory actually exists. Um, anybody heard of the Genie? That's how, if you ever take a look at the Angular JS source code, 
Um, their JS docs have code in them that is actually their protractor test. They have some per process that basically generates their test form out of there. It's crazy stuff. Um, and testability API, that's down here. If you go angular.gettestability on your Angular app, it gives you this whole weird API that lets you find a bunch of cool stuff out about your app. Uh, I'm going to do one quick demo. So I basically built a quick uh, protractor test that is testing. Oh, hold on. Uh, I wrote a protractor test that basically goes to Redbox, clicks on the movie links, um, checks how many movies there are, changes the rating to G, makes sure that there's less G-rated movies than all movies, clicks on the first one, selects a hold for DVD pickup, puts in a uh, puts in a zip code and makes sure that it goes to this page. So and that's one test runs in IE and Chrome right now. IE was flaky. And put in uh, browser.sleep just to get something to pass that I really shouldn't have had to do. But, any questions? No? All right. I'm at, thank you.